Hey, my, my audio is on. Hello, my name is Steve Jaguer. And I'm his co-host, Mike Foster. Welcome to C9K. Happy Friday. Hope you had a great week. Jet lagged. Jet lagged. Welcome. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> ah, we, I got right into it. Welcome to your cloud native video newsletter for an impatient world, uh, covering all things Kubernetes, cloud native, what the, the big spenders. And we do our best to show you some form of technology at the end. And we are still trying. How's it yes, going? In the background, I'm still trying to get this thing going. <laughs> yeah, so definitely WTF. I'll talk about my pains with uh, with Acorn coming up during tool time. But uh, you're coming back from DEF CON. We got to talk about Kubernetes 1.25 as well. And, you know, some general WTFs, a little Starlink hack, some some craziness in the world. So yep. uh, definitely got a good show lined up. I think we kick it off before we get into general news. Maybe we just talk about some DEF CON summary. I'm very curious what your thoughts, opinions on the event was. How'd it go? Yeah, I can do that. Uh, yeah, uh, well, let, let me be clear. I started, lots of things overlapped uh, last week. So there was B-sides, which is like for all the indie kids. And then that seems to butt up to DEF CON and kind of almost intentionally conflicting with Black Hat, which is on simultaneously. Black Hat was where like our my company, and probably your company, had sponsorship and is largely perceived to be sort of corporate. And so we decided to go to the non-corporate things. In fact, the, the hack you're talking about was presented at Black Hat, so I missed that talk completely, which was why I'm interested in what we're gonna show here. So B-Sides was like, it felt like it was in a kid's high school and had lots of talks and it felt super, I don't want to call it uh, granola. Maybe that's a way of putting it really mm -hmm. old school. Like it was great. Like it felt small enough. I don't know, maybe I wasn't at like the DEF CON zero to 10, but it felt like it was probably like so tiny and uh, like a, almost like a charity event. event. I like B-Sides, this is a charity. Um, That I really loved it. I love B-Sides. And then, I, I got a culture shock because this was my first DEF CON. And I went, to, I'm, I'm going to throw this up there because I know this is a tab, but it needs to preface my prep. Okay. Okay. Because this was released just before I went. Because I was, you know, I, I heard stories and I'm freaking out, right? And so here's Ian Meyer released this the Friday before DEF CON, the DEF CON advice, right? Mm -hmm. One, you don't have to drink to be welcomed by people, but you may have to drink to welcome people. That's what he's missing there. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I like down here was his number two. Might want to zoom in not... a little bit. Oh, sorry. Like yeah, noise. yeah, yeah. That's really small. You do not need a burner phone and to throw your gear into the sun after returning. Because <laughs> this is what people told me. And I know th like four years, three, four years ago, pre-pandemic, some friends from Cisco went and they were given burner phones by Cisco. Really? For the event? Yeah. 
Yeah, and my colleague brought an empty laptop and, a, and an unattached phone as well. He used to work at Cisco. <laughs> um, and then I got this one. Every ATM on Vegas is not hacked. So no it, floor, yeah. It's 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 fine. It, it actually just says just kind of just relax and go. You don't have to party till sunrise, although it helps. Uh, but it was like so. I read that and I thought, okay, this isn't going to be. This isn't as bonkers as I was expecting, right? Yep. No, but other aspects are way more bonkers. Like there are people, there are like the true hackers. I would say like, we're not, we're not those people. No. <laughs> These are people who show up like walking around the entire time in what looks like an alien deep sea diver's helmet to, to you know, to preserve their privacy or really? like the high, high scarfed, low hatted, like looking like the red hat character and never taking them off in 37 degree heat. There's a there's a couple dudes who were dressed entirely in furry white rabbit outfits. I I never took them off. It was like, okay, those are the extreme people. I talked to a few people uh, in the evenings and said, "Did you see anything you really liked? You go to any talks?" And they're like, "Oh no, I don't got any talks now." They just, just they just come and meet people and maybe go like the village and village is very free form and that you could spend the whole time and car hacking village, aviation hacking village, lock picking village, buying gadgets like, you know, the Wi-Fi pint. Yeah. You can learn how to pick locks. They have thousands of locks. It's pretty cool. Which is, which was awesome. I mean, and our marketing uh, person, Angela went there because she's like, well, I don't really know hacking, but I'd love to learn how to break into my own house, my <laughs> own house. Nice. Um, well this, so when you arrive, you know, you know how you're used to getting a badge and you know, you went to open source summit and they give you a little sticker that says you're willing to be approached and you get your name yep. and it says you get your pronouns. Um, this is the badge. Oh, what's going on with that badge? There's a lot, uh, a lot of moving pieces there. It's so apparently we don't care about static electricity anymore, but this is like, uh, if I can work it. So you see, it's got the, there's like a selection. And you can move it down and you can choose stuff. And if you just say, now nah, I want to do that, you can go into play and you can go. Okay. And there was a, there was a hack where you had to play like. You had to play that into it yeah. and it, and it released a new challenge. And then you had to find a phone in a room and phone jenny but jenny was written backwards and then so you had to find not phone that song eight six seven five three oh nine but do it type eight, it in six, backwards seven, five, three, oh, yeah, yeah you know the song so you had to phone that <laughs> but then do it in reverse and then it gave you a bunch of cryptic clues then you had to figure out what those meant mm -hmm. and so it was all music related so you had to keep plowing through like we spent an afternoon in a nearby pub just playing with this just playing with the with the badge so it that was bonkers but at the same time i did go to some talks that were really good uh i went to the, there was a cloud village which you could have sat in all day like we could have sat in that all day because every single talk was good and relevant but what i didn't like it was like if you're if you have a if you're a fit of crowds yep. it's freaking crowded like it's only 300 dollars to go and it and into the like whereas kubecon's like 1500 right yeah, 300 and it's in Vegas. So people are going to want to go, right? And it was the first one after a while. And I think the level or the last one was virtual or, or under underwhelmed. And I, so there was that other shortfalls is they ran out of t-shirts like in about well, the T the t-shirt the line to buy or merch line was like an oh. hour queue. Oh, wow. But I mean, sorry, I got a hat, but it was a 30th DEF CON. The logo was I was badass. So I got a woolly hat. Oh, that's pretty cool. So, so like those t-shirts were gone. So I got that. I got a hat. And actually, I'm wearing this shirt. So look at this heavily branded long sleeve. Do you see it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Do you see how subtle it is? Yeah. So I got that. I was pretty happy with that. That's cool. I got this because it was on the wall and nobody thought anything was on it. So I just was like, what's that? Yeah. You have that left in large? Oh, yeah. We got loads of those. Interesting. So, yeah, I like the uh, like oversized black T-shirt, subtle branding. 
Yeah. I think we I'm both kind of went with the same uh, same vibe today. See, <laughs> oh, I got that. If I, if I want a hack, I've got the hood. Where's the Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That side. There's a little. Yeah, black hood, not black hat. Yeah, <laughs> that's me. Skull and crossbones. So, so that's how it was. And I, I was a bit overwhelmed on the first day. And then by the second day, I was kind of in, I got, I got it. And I was in the groove and I was enjoying the villages. And I saw a killer talk at the very end where these dudes who were not pen testers just ripped into various rancher products. Um, well, like Longhorn, you could do a lot with Longhorn, regardless of whether you want to hack into it. But it, it has some serious they had some serious criticisms let's say of it how it is written from a security perspective interesting i'm gonna have to go and check that out yeah hopefully it'll be online because it was in the main it's in track one it was being filmed it should be available so look for something that says poning kubernetes okay yeah i mean speaking of poning kubernetes i think uh we're ready to get to the newest version right yeah yeah all right let's uh let's kick off the news General. Yeah, and for those wondering, I got Acorn to work in the background as Steve was talking. <laughs> That's why he was. Yeah, I was kicking. Yeah. Keep talking. I'm like, keep yeah. talking. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 half working. There's still a bug, so I'm I'm gonna have to go and ping some people after the show and say, hey, what I the guess, hell's going on with this? I guess that was sort of but, on theme with my criticism of Rancher. Rancher. <laughs> Technically, a Acorn's not Rancher, just the founder. No, no, I, they weren't criticizing. At no point were they criticizing Rancher itself. But they were just <laughs> yeah. they just seemed to have a real bugbear with Long. With long All right. Yeah. Here we go. Kubernetes 1.5. You zoom in yeah. a little bit as well again. Uh, yeah, we shout out to Sysdig because I think the last, what, three releases now we've gone through and pulled up Sysdig's write-ups? They do a great write-up. They And they mm -hmm. get recommendations from lots of different people as what their favorite features are so that we don't have to do it. Yeah. Yeah, 1.25 is released, brings 40 enhancements on par with 46 and 1.24. I think the biggest one, obviously, is the final removal of PSPs, which we've talked dun, about dun, last dun. year. What's going to happen? So if you've, if you've got PSPs and you upgrade to 1.25, I haven't even read what happens. Does it go, uh, hey, or does it just go, I don't know what these are? I'm assuming, well... Since 1.21, whenever you've used PSPs, it's always come up with a warning, right? Saying, hey, right. this will not be available. It's deprecated 1.25. So I'm sure there will be like a final, yeah, this is not in this release. If you want to use PSPs, you need to downgrade to 1.24, right? Right. And this I'm is why I was wondering, will anybody who does use PSPs and level of anger, you've had four versions, which is what, like two years? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, two. they've they've been pretty open about how long it's going to take i think you know you're going to have yeah, large organizations that might have you know an operationalized process around psps and so that's going to be interesting i know um red hat and openshift said that we're going to keep supporting them which is that's weird yeah so it, it's it's a good and a bad thing right it doesn't force organizations to maybe necessarily get blocked by updating to 1.25 right so now it's mm -hmm. like hey you know you get the best and brightest of all the features we're going to support it when you get time go and you know move off of it but then on the other side i think the admission controller is a better system than psps so oh yeah uh, maybe people do need a kick in the butt to actually go and adopt the newer technology i guess from a security standpoint sure it's always a trade-off <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, realistically, it, okay, PSPs are fine. There's some flaws in it, especially like kind of the default fail if you don't have a PSP in your cluster when you start it up, right? Um, yeah. But if you're using a Kubernetes security or container security product, you really aren't using PSPs that much, right? You're using security context, you're using that, but I don't know. I, I find that they're not as adopted as I think people make them out to be. I don't know. If I don't know. It's like... Yeah, because when I was when I was working more as a sales engineer, SA or architect, we did run into them a lot because when really? you're trying to sell a security product to a company that is security aware, they probably it's like PSPs was their open source solution yeah. before adopting a commercial one. And they're like, well, common question, like how do you do more than what PSPs do? Like that's I had to put <laughs> my dumb my dumb voice for that. But <laughs> fair enough. Uh, that happened. So people were at least trying to use them. Uh, whether they got anywhere, you know, kind of like often we say with Istio, did they get anywhere with it? I don't know. Um, 
yeah so there there we are oh and by the way the other hack in that talk is istio so you'll you're gonna love it yeah all right oh so so we go look at did you look through the other ones any opinions i did i think user namespaces is really interesting um mm -hmm. forensic container checkpointing I snapshot really cool. yeah allows creating snapshots from a specific container so analysis and investigation can be carried out um, yeah retrieval non-retrieval pod failures for jobs i think that's awesome yeah Basically, you know if <laughs> somebody wants to go create a job yeah okay you can restart it but there should be only so much uh, this is going to allow for cloud costs to remain a little bit less than so you don't have you know especially data scientists running massive pipeline jobs you do not yeah. want those to be constantly created and recreated um i think I bet you that was a bugbear big time yeah i think that's a really good one um I really like the forensic. I mean, I don't want to hover on it too long, but forensic container checkpointing, the idea of creating snapshots of running containers for analysis, obviously Sysdig loves it because it's probably right in their sweet spot. Yep. But it is something that I know organizations who have, who have tried to do this manually, like have struggled to try and create the concept of a sandbox checkpointed forensic container based on triggers so that, that you know you could see where where it stood from an attack perspective. At the same time, you want to kill off that attack, right? But you don't want to lose the evidence. Mm -hmm. It's it's amazing. So I'm super super big fan of that. Yeah, and I think it's really good. The, the tie into the security tools and the options now are greater. Like let's say you're ACS or Stackrocks, and now instead of, you can trigger a notification maybe on a netcat run or something like that in the container. But not only that, you might be able to trigger maybe a job where it goes and takes a snapshot of everything after and automatically exports it. Now you can do that in the interface, but it might just, it's, it's more of a Kubernetes native way of doing it. You don't have to actually go and engineer it on the back end as a, right, for a security tool. Like instead of going and saying, hey, here's admin controls, go in and look at the container that creates an audit log right now. It's just a separate container that pops up and takes a snapshot, I'm assuming. Yeah, well, well, it'll actually be a good demo. So let's put that yeah. in our list of things we can try and see how it actually works. Because it reminds me, remember that uh, open source tool we talked about about uh, a couple months ago on the show, where they would, if they detected something, they would put a timer on the container via an admission controller that would eventually shut it down. That's right. Yep. So that would this would be a huge upgrade for that because that that made me kind of go really because then you, but if they added this to that open source project, then. Ah, mm. It is another piece of the, let's say, moving pieces in Kubernetes that's going to have admin permissions and be a little bit over authorized to do things. So from a security yeah, standpoint, a, I'm kind of, yeah. you know, it's it's like, yeah, it's a great feature, being able to snapshot everything in the cluster at a specific time, but then that is now your target if you're a hacker, right? Something like that that's not set up properly, unauthenticated, not unauthenticated, but improperly configured maybe. I, I'm kind of just need to get hands on with it, see how they, they set it up. I'm sure they thought about yeah. all of these when they developed it. Oh, I'm sure they did, yeah. They're playing <laughs> devil's advocate big time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any last words on the release before we get into next topic? Uh, last thing I would say, there's a lot of uh, API changes mm. yep. there. I've been seems, bit by that. Seems like 1.25, they realized it's going to be a hurdle for updates, and so they just threw them all in there at one time. Yeah, you could, uh, could, could, could break some things, but yeah, just a. I mean, one. yeah, you have a lot of V1 betas. So these are things that never really, I think, made it to stable. Yeah, exactly. No longer being served. But yeah, so mm. just to note some changes there. Maybe that's just my personal experience of getting messed about by API <laughs> de deprecations and changes because oh, I yeah. am. Like all people, uh, sometimes lazy. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some more than others. Uh, what do we got coming up next? So we had that. I think I, there's a hybrid cloud blog. I added a report that mm. uh, HashiCorp released. Um, where'd you go? Where'd you go? Oh, there we go. Making multi-cloud work. Now I realize this is I'm not- I'm gonna tell you to zoom in every time you pull up a new tab. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah, look at the size of this. Now, there's big, big numbers coming. Okay. So you don't have to read any of this. You just got to do this, like that. You can see that. Oh, okay. All right. Numbers 90, to remember. Sorry. Just All can't right, read so the stuff underneath. <laughs> 90. There you go. There you go. 90% of P, uh, org, orgs surveyed 
said, multi-cloud is working. See, see security as a key driver of cloud success. How, are you, do you think these are big numbers? Uh, this seems pretty heavily biased. <laughs> Wait, I'll, my I don't favorite think it's number, wrong. Though, I don't think no. it's wrong. It's just, uh, this is definitely like their specific user base that they emailed out to, right? Well, it's HashiCorp, yeah. yeah. So you got to keep that in mind. Uh, but I, I love 94. Are wasting money in the cloud. It should be 100. <laughs> it should be 100%. Yeah, it should be 100. Too low. <laughs> Who is not wasting money in the cloud? Yeah. So, so Come on. You, yeah, where, where are you, 6%? Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was good. It's Number a, one it's ranking scary. skills shortages. I mean, yeah, you you know, it's hard yeah. enough knowing one cloud. You know, get into multi cloud. Obviously, there's just more moving parts. Yep, yep. So there's some other stuff in here. That that was the main thing I wanted to see. Business and factors in multi cloud adoption. But mainly, I would just say liability was number one. That's interesting. Oh yeah. Digital transformation, scalability, security, and governance. That was all just kind of makes sense. It seems well, people pretty think, like not very differentiated between the percentages. You'd think, yeah, uh, yeah, and it is really close, isn't it? It's almost a tie across the board, really, from a error perspective. Yeah, but I could see that people think reliability, like they there's this um, kind of hocus pocus around uh, thinking, well, well, I shouldn't just rely on one cloud because AWS went down last year, so I should have a multi cloud solution. Um, I mean, the reality is your multi-cloud is probably the reason you're wasting money as much as you are because being single cloud for all its faults can can actually be a more economical way of managing things. It, yeah, it really depends on what your workloads are, I think. True. Um, but the, yeah, there's a whole, now you're just literally getting into Red Hat's pitch, so. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Anyway, anyway, we don't have to spend too much time on it. It's a, it's a worthily downloadable um, study made by people who create Terraform, which is designed to be multi-cloud. So and I don't vault. know why that, and Vault. So um, take that, take the answers with a grain of salt. But yeah, still and if content. you're uh, if you're watching in the future, all the links are in the description below and you can hit that little notification bell. So you know- Yeah, they're there now. I, I made sure I got them in there before we put it live. So you feel free, but don't leave the show. Yeah. Do it later. <laughs> exactly. All right, I think uh, we're into some of the craziness, right? That's fast. Meh. 25 minutes or 24 minutes. I don't know. We're into the crazy stuff. I think we're on right. time. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. I rambled a bit at the beginning to give you some uh, delay time. All right. All right. Yeah, so I put this one on there as a WTF. Yeah. I thought it was very interesting. We I think we've talked about this maybe once or twice. Conversation keeps Whoa. coming up. Please stop forcing little... users to reset complex passwords. Now, I'm not sure already. what you use internally, Steve. We do not use complex passwords. It's a mix of dual uh, two-factor authentication with sort of a code line, password. Anyways, there's a whole authentication thing there. But what's nice is I don't really have to remember any passwords. It's sweet. You use a password manager. I do, but then the way that we set it up as well, you don't need a complex password. It's like, you know, OTP, it's Authenticator, it's Google Auth, it's, it's yeah. all that stuff. So it's it's really great. Um, and yeah, I'm a big fan of using two-factor authentication, whether it's through text or a YubiKey or something like that. We do not need, you know, I remember when I was working as a process engineer at a plant, every three months you had to change your password and it had to be extremely complex. And it's almost yeah. like if you have to, if if you just gave everybody along with their badge like a YubiKey, where every single time I logged into the computer, I had to insert the YubiKey, it would work. The problem is, is you, um, without sounding too ageist, there's a lot of people at the company where something like that implemented also becomes an issue. People lose their YubiKeys now; they have to go upstairs and get authenticated. Somebody's got to give them another one, right? So there's a whole other <laughs> issue with that. But um, there is. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's almost more of a security hassle, though, and a security issue instead of, you know, allowing just a decent password that somebody can continue to use. Um, yeah, because really, you know, how often is that getting exposed? Oh, it's ridiculous. I mean, they've got some really good examples in this article where they're you know, talking about how long it takes to actually. Well, I guess the thing I took away is longer passwords are, are fine. They don't have to be complex. 
I mean, we, so here we have all the same things you're talking about. Like we utilize physical authentication. Like if your laptop has it, we use it. Um, we use 2FA, we can use one-time passwords, depending on what you've got enabled. We use UV keys. We use all the things that are all available to you. But we also, if you need a password, your passwords can be long phrases yep. of perfectly normal characters. And that those are also fine. So I, but we, we talk about, right? We work at companies who understand security. Um, I had last time I worked at a company that didn't, I had the 14 character generated goofball password. Ooh, brutal. Um, where, you know, you end up, but, and it was a master password and anyways, it's disaster. So this is, this can't be stated enough. This article, particularly to companies. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you think about how much wasted time when you get to uh, a large organization just dealing with passwords and all those tickets and, hey, I'm locked out. Hey, I do this. Hey, I need to fix this. It's just so much time, so much wasted effort yeah. for, uh, I mean, I understand that it's pretty important that you don't get hacked, <laughs> but there are definitely some newer ways to uh, to manage all that stuff now. Exactly. All right. This is, uh, and it actually Ooh. mentions that this talk came at DEF CON last week. So that's right. This is the one. Uh, and I wanted to see it because I saw it on the list, but I was not at that. <laughs> so, uh, the, all right. What's the gist? Uh, so basically, because SpaceX is so publicly accessible, they have over 3,000 satellites in orbit. It also means that they are very accessible to attacks. And it's a very easy vector for anybody in the world, right? Relatively. Everybody can yeah. see the network. Therefore, Everybody has the ability to sort of go after it. Um, now, the attack results in an unfixable compromise of the Starlink user terminal that allows us to execute arbitrary code. The ability to obtain root access on Starlink is a prerequisite to freely explore the Starlink network. He is warned of SpaceX flaws in their system. SpaceX did respond by updating the system, but Wouters argues that the only sure way to avoid this attack is to create a new version of the main chip. So this is somewhat of a hardware flaw, it sounds like. Oops. Well, here we go. Um, Maybe we can run, route this show through Starlink next time. They don't exactly explicitly say what the issue is, but 3,000 satellites in orbit, if it's a hardware issue. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah. That's uh, that's rough. Yeah. You could, there's another demo for us. I mean, $25 hacking tool. Let's get one. Yeah, no kidding. Um, but very cool. They said they patched it. We'll see. Might have to come back uh, next week for another WTF. Tune in next week where we hack into Starlink. <laughs> I mean, it's not even hacking anymore if they've written a tool. It's just us running a thing. Mm -hmm. That's All funny. Right. Just a, just a, hold on. Just a reference back. Remember I talked about villages at, at DEF CON? One of the coolest things was that you could buy things that looked like the badge, like that. Uh, there was one that would hack into cars. So it had everything you needed in terms of like. Oh, I think he just muted himself. Or that's uh, StreamYard's way of saying, hey, Steve. <laughs> Move some stuff around on your desk. And this is a true WTF. Oh, am I still on? No, there you go. And he's back. My bike's back. All right, great. Sorry. Yeah, you just got to sometimes it decides. If your Bluetooth goes out or something, it just thinks it's a good safety measure that it mutes for you, but it's also a message from God. <laughs> um, they sell they sell little badges that do all sorts of hacking. So if you want to get like mm. hacking, it looks like a little skull and crossbones, but it's got all the hardware, bus interfaces, protocols you need to mess with cars all in one little wear around your neck. Obviously, I'm a hacker badge, so it's kind of cool. I mean, I guess they do it at Black Hat too. So neat. Very cool. Anyway, anyway. Moving on. Yeah, so I think I put this one in. It's a little bit of phishing attempt. So callback phishing attacks see massive 625% growth since Q1. This makes sense. I think all of the multi-factor and authentication, the rise of that sort of safety mechanism just is leading people to move towards social engineering instead of just general email and password attempts, right? Most people have some sort of two factor now. So you really have to get the other person on the line and interested in the conversation first, whether it's, hey, send me some money or 
you know, you have to give us X, Y, Z in order to get access, send us the code, right? Hey, you, you get a one-time password code sent to your phone. We're going to need it in order to verify that you're, you're not stealing money from us. We're the government, whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, just as a general thing, obviously, if you have everything that's two, uh, multi-factor or two-factor authentication, this is really the only way you're going to get exploited. It's very, very, I think we always see a random article that comes out that says, yeah, we've exploited multi-factor. And then the patch comes out like a week later yeah. or it's, it's extremely, extremely hard. So it's funny along the lines of this, this reminds me, and I, I'll probably keep doing this for the next two weeks. Um, one of the cloud attack things that was talking about multi-factor and getting past it was uh, using phishing attacks mm -hmm. was saying, if you're going to send somebody a phishing attack, rather than put a link in it, put a QR code because things like Sophos and malware don't, can't see it. Yep. And so he's like, so you start with that and then you move forward. And then he did a live, uh, how to get past MFA, like via just starting with a QR code. And I was like, oh, that's pretty clever actually. That is. All right. We're almost there. Almost. We have two more WTFs to, to to get through you Boom. put this one on it's a terra list it's not a terrifying terror oh god if this had made a bad terra list joke <laughs> so terrifying now this is this is what i want you to digest a truly private terraform registry yeah that's right there it is okay as opposed to all those other ones that just say they're private this is the one that's private for what was it for, for providers and modules following the published hashicorp tools secure way to distribute your confidential modules and providers and a management interface. So then I guess as I threw this in here to get your comment, like we need this, do we need this? Is there like, are there private, is this for internal deployment? I'm assuming just because Terraform has an open registry that you can pull from, right? right. But I mean, the, the perks obviously is you can share a lot of Terraform objects with other people. The downside, obviously, is that you might get a insecure configuration that's uploaded to these registries that you pull from. Uh, I'm assuming, yeah. I always thought that you could create private registries internally. I'm not completely sure. I, I need to go into detail. I haven't uh, been hands on with Terraform mm -hmm. in a while. Um, you know, yeah. all and all that stuff. So, <laughs> it, well, yeah, so I'm sorry. Yeah. They, uh, <laughs> nice. Well, I, I mean, I sent this to our, our team because we're all about Terraform. And I was like, Give me a use case for this because I like the idea of it. I think it sounds a bit cocky with the truly private, but um, it seems interesting because all other forms of, let's say, artifacts, generally there's a way of getting a private version in addition to a public version. But if there is, like, whether it be containers or like py uh, Python modules or something, you can usually create a way of getting things privately. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the idea that there isn't for Terraform is kind of like, I hadn't even considered it. News to me. Yeah. I mean, use a private S3 bucket or a proxy. There's the modules registry there. Yeah. So that's, hmm. I think it's interesting. And if you're, if you're in a Terraform, there you go. Go check it out. Link, link below. Link below. And then I think uh, the last one, speaking of which, I just switched that tab and just blasted in my ears. Oh, it uh, Yeah. I so Steve snuck this one in last minute for the WTF and it's a Excel Esports All-Star Battle. So it's a Are sort you? of an... Are you going to share? Do you have the tab up? Do you want to share the tab? I, I don't, but I sound. can share it real quick. Share um, it with sound. All right. Do it. I think I gave the link at yeah. four minutes. I, uh, all right. There we go. There it is. But you want to go to add four minutes? No, you're there. You you're there. Yeah. Yeah. It's at. So these are. Everybody see this? I can, I can hear it as well. Right. So these are, these are Microsoft Excel rock stars. They can create Microsoft Excel like this, obviously. Like Ten thousand hours spent. So, just zip forward a little bit. Okay. <laughs> if he was a function, unique. <laughs> it's. So the idea is, I right. I've never heard of this. I, I heard of this via. All right. Well, we have a, an exciting day. All right, just kill it. Rounds. Okay. No, we don't. We don't have an exciting day. It's not exciting at all. I <laughs> zoomed ahead. What happens is so what? There's oh, I got ads. No. Oh, uh, just kill it. Yeah. All right. So, 
So this was put on by the Financial Modeling World Cup. Okay. Didn't know that existed. And these are Microsoft, these people are so good at Microsoft Excel that they get given, you know, the requirement and they start building out Excel spreadsheets and they have to get the right data outcome at the end. Mm -hmm. And this has got commentary, video graphics, uh, world-class experts. Like, how do you, what? And this is, this was on, I think, ESPN. <laughs> ESPN yeah. 8, the Ocho? <laughs> what is this? I don't, I don't know which. Yeah, yeah, I think so. But I was like, "What the hell?" This this was anyway. I heard, I saw this because uh, Clint uh, Gibbler mentioned it, and I thought, "Okay, I've got to put this in the show." It's such a gigantic WTF, and it has nothing to do with security. Just it was hilarious. It was in a security newsletter, though, so that that qualifies. Very cool. No, <laughs> I mean, I think it's cool. I, it, well. I think it's crazy well, that it's even a, a thing, but uh, that's a lot of hours in Excel. Yes. Yes. That's time you can't get back. All right. I think we did it. We're done the WTFs and let's see where the money's flowing. Let's do it. Uh, yes. Oh, you found this Nightfall mm -hmm. 40 million in Series B. Now, this is going to be one of those ones that I'm asking you have you heard of them? No, first time. I do see the application for it. It's probably going to get more and more valuable. Nightfall is built to discover, classify, and protect data across any app. We use machine learning to zero in on the data that you deem critical, like PII and credentials for easy, comprehensive coverage without the alert fatigue without the alert fatigue see that's interesting that's i mean maybe it's really easy to do without alert fatigue but if you're comparing yourself to any other security yeah. tool that's a so, good advertising word yeah my guess is you know if as things become more everything as code you're going to get nightfalls be more and more applicable partially when they talk about alert fatigue i think they give you basically an uh, machine learning program underneath, but you're teaching it what it's supposed to care about and what it isn't, right? So, which is good in terms of, oh yeah, okay, we know this app, we don't really care about the secret, but you also can get false, not false positives, right? Like if you over teach it to not care about specific things and then it doesn't alert you when something is really supposed to matter. Oh yeah. It's that's kind of a black box, right? Yeah, it's, it's, way it's worse. always It's always the knock against all the machine learning security tools that automate enforcement and things like that it's is it a black box do i know why and how it's enforcing if it's making this decision is it telling me and then if it is well then that's also alert fatigue anyways right because every time yeah. you're making a decision you're giving me a rationalization instead of just me implementing the policy and understanding all of its effects well i mean it can be a huge if it comes with some models which it must right yeah and if it's a, particularly if it's also a SaaS solution where it can anonymously generate models based on other uh, you know, visibility into other data, which who knows if they're allowed to do that. That's that's a because classifying your data is a huge pain in the backside. Yeah. So if that can accelerate that, even if it does kind of a sloppy job and you got to kind of clean it up afterwards, it's, that's it seems like a pretty good product. Yeah. And it also kind of it helps you direct the different teams to maybe shore up their defenses, right? You know, these are yeah. our, our crown jewel applications and the crown jewel of all of our data, the things that we really care about. Okay, well, I can put some notifications around it and make sure the team is doing everything they can to secure it. Or it, it could be an instance where it says, uh, this 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 data over here is super sensitive because it's got all these passwords in it. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, I didn't even know that. Passwords in that data. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whoa, whoa. Yeah, the, uh, what was it? Oklahoma probably could have used that when they sent out uh, everybody's <laughs> social security numbers in HTML. There go, yeah, there you go. Good. Uh, and then, uh, so the final big spender, not really a big spender, but I thought it was really curious because we talked about Acorn, we talked about a couple of these other companies and um, let's say how they get funding for this stuff. Yeah. So Lockheed Martin doubles the size of its VC fund to 400 million. And so not only are there VC funds externally, right, but there's VC funds in all these companies. And I think mm. a lot of these companies realize that 
it's hard to build things internally. It's hard to get sign off. It's very hard to move fast when you have a yep. large monolithic company. And it's way better to, let's say, invest in companies that have a similar infrastructure. Let's say you use Google, you use Teams and Microsoft. Get that company started with the same infrastructure underneath. Let them run with a, with an idea. If they get bought out by a competitor, well, then you just took a ton of money from the competitor because you had how much invested at the beginning. Um, and maybe you just absorb it back into your company, and you get to write it off as a uh, you get to write it off as a loss during the investment, as a loss during that, and then the capital gains when you buy it. So you're basically just funneling money into your own pocket and taking the write off. Do you think that's what Acorn is? Because Acorn comes off Rancher, like, like do you think that's funded by Susan? Like that would be a great model. I... Oh, oh, oh. Ooh, excuse me. Um, I think so. It makes a lot of sense. It's a win-win. I don't know exactly. I would be surprised if they had other funding as well. But mm -hmm. um, I was going to show you an article. And there's an article coming up about open source Acorn takes out a new approach to deploy cloud native apps on Kubernetes. And they specifically kind of attack the operator model. So it's very Ooh. rancher and SUSE specific. They're always going after the operator framework. Um, yeah, I mean, it That's makes it. sense. It, like just in terms of what they're going for, how it's going to get a probably absorbed you know rancher is more developer focused more get started with kubernetes right mm -hmm. um i think openshift and red hat are a little bit more enterprise right more support focused bigger companies so uh, i'll get into that rant though during tool time okay uh then i think that's a great idea companies should do what lockheed are doing yeah time for we got one cv yeah one or quick one. exploit now, what starts with the letter C? Yes. So Rapid7 does a bunch of work, which is security research work, and they have discovered some vulnerabilities in Cisco, Firepower, and ASDM. Now, this is probably not relevant to anybody watching the show, but I thought it was... It was also interesting just the way they disclosed it because uh, the conversation got brought up internally when you thought about uh, Spring for Shell and Log for Shell. Those vulnerabilities weren't really disclosed very well. Yeah. Right? Like it was, it came out and then the actual vulnerability got published in NIST and the different vulnerability feeds three days later after it came out. And realistically, it should have been at the same time. There shouldn't have been a three-day gap. It led a lot of people to be, you know, how do we know this? We can't see the vulnerability. Well, it's there. And then there's just right. this huge scramble to get your vulnerability feeds patched and updated. Um, you know, certain companies, they just created their own feed, right? Like, so you can add it into your application um, extremely, like before the it gets published on uh, most of the databases. But yeah, again, credit. So it was discovered by uh, Jake Baines of Rapid7. It's being disclosed with accordance with the vulnerability disclosure policy. These things matter, um, and I thought it was just worth a shout-out to say, hey, you found vulnerabilities, you did it the right way. This didn't become an issue, and it won't be for most of Cisco's ASA, ASDM, and Firepower Services software users, <laughs> right? All right. Yeah. There you go. For all you kids watching, responsible disclosure. Yeah, then you don't get uh, accused right. of hacking or doing dumb things. So, Precisely. Amazing. All right. Quick one's all a good right. one. All right. Acorn rent coming up. preface with the rant <laughs> <laughs> it is a rant uh yeah open source acorn takes on uh, a new approach to deploy cloud native apps on kubernetes if you don't mind zooming in um yeah I, I love how basically every blog just comes out with kubernetes has become the de facto standard for multi-cloud deployments it's kind of every article just has to have this preface all the time i i think it's kind of funny including Red Hat, OpenShift, and Suze Rancher, which I thought it was interesting that those two get called out. That's right? that's that's intentional. It's very intentional. So <laughs> packaging, deploying applications and running cloud native environments, blah, blah, blah. Acorn is looking to help solve that. There's no shortage of vendors in the Kubernetes space, but Acorn's pedigree is particularly strong. Specifically talking about the co-founders. Yeah. From Rancher. Yeah. <laughs> uh, prior to Rancher, the group founded cloud.com. Uh, they have been in a bunch of products or projects right over the past 20 years and they they do a lot of good work 
Now, the promise of Acorn, a seed that will grow to a cloud native workload. And then it actually gets into Helm charts, Kubernetes operators. Uh, was it, is it, what's CNAB again? I forget what that acronym is. Cloud native application bundle. Yeah, that's for right? their, yeah, that's their, what they're doing. That's what they're building. Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting because they, they call out the fact that, you know, Helm chart is the most used way of deploying an application. Uh, but then they say it kind of, it's supposed to, uh, do, 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 where does it say exactly? Um, Acorn's founders see the technology as being a rival to Kubernetes operators. The concept of Kubernetes operators was pioneered by CoreOS in 2016 and integrated into Red Hat OpenShift. When CoreOS was acquired by Red Hat in 2018 for 250 million, the promise of an operator is to go beyond just the deployment with a Helm chart. So they're specifically saying that it is the rival to the operator, which I found really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. When you get into Acorn's architecture, and actually, let me... Do I do you want to segue straight in? Uh, yeah, let me get 10,000 right. foot view. Okay. okay, let me pull up my out. screen because that'll be infinitely easier. Uh, do, 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 window. I Make like sure the there. idea there of go. something uh, competing with the operator model. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind it. Um, I, I think operators have their place. I think Helm charts have their place. I think anything that you really... I personally love operators for managing upgrades and, and life cycle and not having to go to Helm chart and just be able to go and say, yeah, I want it updated. I want a stable release and then going and pulling that as they come out, especially for the default Kubernetes features and functionality, right? For my application alone, I wouldn't necessarily use an operator. I'd probably do something like an Argo CD, use some sort of tool for deployment, rollbacks, updates. Uh, I think that that's the use case. Okay. You go with that. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, I think that explanation is good. Um, now, where this comes in is it's trying to basically add an API server so you can bundle all of your application, especially for developers, in a more succinct way. You don't want developers dealing with network policies, uh, with you know PSPs or the pod security emission controller and all of these crazy features. Yeah, it exactly you, gets you, too unwieldy. You, yeah. And oh, so wait, the, you should also, also you should make this diagram bigger. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're doing. That's what I actually meant. There you yeah, go. there you go. Uh, all right. So it, it just gets too unwieldy. And what they really want to do is get to this point. Like you see, there's a build kit. There's an internal registry. There's an Acorn API server um, where I can just go and package a Docker file. Say I want specific ports open. Say I want the specific configuration. It packages it all in one go. You can sign it all so that the configuration, if it's ever changed, you can verify that it was changed by somebody. Um, and it goes and deploys it. And I'm assuming that when they say they want to get rid of operator, that Acorn API server that sits in Kubernetes is going to be looking at changes to the Acorn file. So if you update the configuration of the Acorn file, it's going to update the configuration in Kubernetes. Now, that is basically what an operator does. <laughs> so I'm, I think the differentiation is, is typically you have an operator for each application. Whereas if you have one Acorn API server on the cluster, you only have one sort of hub that will update and authorize everything, maybe multiple applications at one time. I'm assuming that's the promise because otherwise this architecture looks very similar to, hey, I have an application. Here's all my Kubernetes YAML files and charts. And if I make changes, the operator can go and just verify that and change the application on the fly as long as the, you, know, you didn't make any database breaking changes, you should be good. Right? Like I can change the port. I can go into uh, the OpenShift console and change a specific port in the YAML files, and the operator will go and apply it, right? So again, I, I the differentiation to me when it's like, hey, we're going to replace the operator, I'm like, you kind of just took the operator framework, made it into a single point, and then added the Acorn-specific language to frame the application better for developers, which I'm, I'm actually all for. I think the language is awesome. Um, but yeah, so let's just run through this. This was, so originally I had an OpenShift cluster. It uh, didn't want to work on me this morning. So we uh, <laughs> went to GKE and I actually have a couple bugs. I got I to gotta ping some Acorn people about with the new Kubernetes version. So um, Acorn install, it actually works extremely easy. Once you download the Acorn CLI, if you have a Mac, it's just brew install Acorn. Um, pretty much good to go. If you have a Qconfig, Kubernetes cluster, Pointed at that, say Acorn install, it goes and deploys Acorn into 
your cluster. Not mine though, because I didn't really like it this morning. Um, yeah, so they, they walk through, they give you a basic app, um, Python app. Actually, let me zoom out a little bit. Uh, you have a requirements file, it gives you the Docker file. So again, this is a typical development workflow that your developer should be used to. We're not changing too much. Now here's the biggest change. You have an acorn file. So you can have arguments just like you would in a Kubernetes YAML if you want to pass arguments in. Here is sort of this JSON type version of your Kubernetes, right? YAML. You have a container, you have an app, you're building in this directory. Here's your environment variables. What does it depend on? If args are app, then you can publish it. You have a cache. You have a database, you have a directory, you have files, you have ports. Local data, not completely sure about this one. I'm assuming this is in the application. Um, and then volumes, secrets as well. Any questions so far, Steve? I don't get it. Like, it looks... <laughs> yeah, you, know, you think about a Kubernetes YAML file and everything a developer would have to put into it, and especially the formatting. It's trying to take that away. But again, it really is just sort of giving you a distilled version in terms of what the developer needs, right? Whereas you'd have a lot more metadata when you're working with Kubernetes YAMLs. So we're abstracting away a little bit. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, but you can do it with customize. Maybe it's you, sloppier. Yeah, I, and I, but I think what also is added on is the lifecycle aspect that customize doesn't have. Right? Or like, Helm, actually. Or, or, I, I, they're both the same. Yeah, yeah like I, I, I see Acorn as a mix between an operator and a Helm chart. They've just identified this little space and they've said, okay, well, you know, we don't want something as heavy as an operator, especially multiple operators. You know, you can get very consuming for managing, possibly. Uh, and then they don't want Helm chart where it's just like Helm install and it's a command line install to update a chart, right? So you want a little bit of both. And with a lot oh, of like the old, features. Like, like, like the old Helm with Tiller. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that, that really is it. Because instead of Tiller, like you have Acorn installed in your cluster. It's going to have admin permissions. By the way, it specifically calls out that you need admin permissions to install Acorn. Like it, it that's pretty old, much that's is a Tiller hell. architecture. Yeah, it's pretty much a Tiller architecture, except one of the differences is that you can like deploy it locally, make changes, package everything up, and then it will automatically apply it in the cluster. Versus with Helm, you had to actually go and authenticate. You had to go and push it to Tiller to make the changes. Right. So I think there's a little bit more of a lifecycle aspect, especially with. I, I think it's pretty useful in a like a development context where. You know, I'm a developer, I'm running it locally, I'm just making changes, and then maybe I want to push to Kubernetes to make sure that the Acorn file and the environment is set up properly, right? Well, then I can package it all up, sign it, which I think is one of the biggest issues that we're overlooking is in the future where everything wants to be signed and authorized, your configuration mm -hmm. and your container are all signed as one commit, right? Which I think is great because a developer can go and say, okay. yes, that is my signature, that is my application, the way I configured it. And if anybody changes it, uh, then we'll know. I think that's that's playing into the next two to three years of development right. around signatures. Mm -hmm. uh, what else is left? Um, so there's a whole explaining the Acorn file. It's a really good app if you get a chance. Uh, Docs.acorn.io, getting started. It's just a simple mkdocs uh, application or website. Um, and then run your Acorn app. So acorn run dot namespace awesome acorn. It builds it and runs it. And if I can switch over, we'll see if this actually works well. So I'm in the Acorn app. If I look at what I have here, I have the Acorn file, the Docker file, the app, and the requirements.txt. If you have Acorn running, it's simple as Acorn. Add that? Hmm? Are we supposed to be watching this? Oh, yeah. That's actually probably pretty good. Just yeah, we could we just use your voiceover alone. <laughs> <Yeah. Just>, uh, <laughs> that was a pretty good voiceover, but you know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so based on the the example that's there in the docs, you have the Acorn file, the Docker file, uh, your Python file. I'm doing this for the second time, and your requirements.txt. And if you want to run it, um, doo -doo -doo, you have your Acorn run. It will go build it uh, locally, push it. Now, there's this weird bug that I got, and I don't know if I can show this, but if I do a 
Okay, go on and install. It's working to work. Anyway, so there's this weird authentication issue with Kubernetes 1.25 that I've been trying to figure out. And basically what's happening is the authentication between kubectl, kubectl, uh, G Clouds, Kubernetes version, and Acorn, they just really don't want to talk to each other. So Acorn goes to call Kubernetes to install Acorn in Kubernetes cluster. It might go and say, hey, kubectl, uh, go and install me. Kubectl then has to go and say, hey, GCP, do you have the authentication for this? So I think there's some sort of weird roundabout. Anyways, I was getting a you know, auth can't find provider GCP. And so then what's happening in the screen right now is it's trying to push locally, but I don't have a local cube config. So it's, there's a whole mix behind Acorn trying to call out to the cloud provider. Um, mm. Anyways, but yeah, it's funny because Acorn's actually installed in GCP. So if I do like, uh, get fun, <laughs> Acorn's installed. So when I ran Acorn install, it goes there. And then now when mm -hmm. I'm typing Acorn build or Acorn uh, run, it's not going and pushing it to the right system. It's pushing it locally, even though the, I, my only cube config is this GCP cluster. That's super weird. It is. And I'm sitting here like I know, like I'm pretty dumb, but this, this seems, uh, <laughs> I don't know That's what I'm doing wrong. Right. So is that as far as you got? Did you ever get past it? Uh, I got it deployed in OpenShift last night, but then uh, for some reason I am in like a shared lab environment with a couple other engineers, and I think somebody restarted a node on me. Oh yeah, accident. so yeah, yeah, I gotta get sent. Uh, I'm gonna send a very mean email to somebody after this. Ah, oh, you're too nice. All right, so you got to a <laughs> point where, and, and this is Kubernetes. This is one two five that you deployed. That is, do you think that's the? Uh, I I don't think it's one two five. I think. The kubectl is 1.244, okay. kubectl. I think it's basically the auth plugin in between the two. So when, G, when you go yeah. gcloud, use this. gcloud yeah. goes and talks to kubectl and says, hey, where's your config and all this stuff. And I think what's happening is Acorn is going and talking to kubectl, but not talking to gcloud for the authentication. Does that make right. sense? Yep. So everybody's going to kubectl. But then gcloud would authenticate kubectl. It's gcloud is not authenticating kubectl for acorn. You know? Okay. So yep. one of the one of the ways I got acorn to install is I had to export a couple variables to get it to go. Um, specifically like use gcp auth equals true. But then when I do that, it allows me to install acorn. But then when I go deploy the application, it tries to deploy it locally. So there's this weird. That's so weird. It is very yeah. weird. And I'm going to spend the rest of the day trying to figure it out. Well. You know what? Um, like that's still a that's still a, a a demo for viewers who are like going, oh boy, I'll try it. And okay, maybe I won't. Maybe I'll wait yeah. next week when Foster's just fixed it. And so <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and I could show it to you if if you want to do that. Because when I was on OpenShift last night, there's a couple more features that I thought were pretty cool. Um, Acorn has so instead of like doing a kubectl exec or kubectl do whatever, it's just Acorn exec, and you can go right into your application. It's kind of scoped to the application as you deploy it. So instead of okay. you know handing a developer a, a namespace or whatever, you know the developer just has that application and they're deploying it. And Acorn retains that context, which is super nice. You can also yeah. deploy in an interactive mode, so I can go and deploy it and then make changes to the code. And as I'm making changes, it will deploy, it will build and deploy it to Kubernetes extremely fast, which I think is pretty cool. So not only can you know you're developing a container you're using Docker Desktop, whatever it is. Or rancher desktop, as I think that they want to uh, to push. Um, sure. You know, you can make those changes quickly, but then you want to see what it's like in Kubernetes, so you can kind of get both environments going at the same time. Um, I can have you know a web page open, a web browser open, and I can look at my app as I make changes. So it's pretty cool. Um, hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. We're coming up on the hour anyway, so that was actually a pretty good succinct little right. go. Well, I mean, it's, it's a deployment. If we just kind of close our eyes and pretend it worked, <laughs> it was all there. It's fine, except it didn't because it tried to apply locally. But you know, that's uh, honestly, if if uh, anybody wants to go do it, GKE it takes five minutes to start up a cluster. Acorn, in terms of the brew CLI and install GCP auth login, you can get going in twelve minutes, 10, 15 minutes, pretty easily. So, yeah, I was talking for 11 minutes at the start, so that's yeah. the benchmark. Yeah, do it. Uh, <laughs> let me know. Ping me. You can always like write in the comments and say, hey, Foster, did you forget this? Did you forget to outsource this? Yes, yeah. please. There you go. Yeah. That's call out to the comments. Yeah. Fix it for us. Yeah, please. 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 All right. 
Well, cool. Thanks for uh, diving in there uh, at the last minute uh, after having a crashed cluster this morning <laughs> yeah. or no sabotaged cluster this morning. Your coworkers love you. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Um, but yeah, thanks. Any uh, final send offs? We'll be back next week, 10 a.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. GMT. We're not traveling for a while. I think this is like the first time we're home for a couple weeks in a row this summer. Yeah, I think I think so. Yeah, I think. What do you got anything coming up? I think I might have an open source summit in Europe in August. This is September, so Ooh. there might be some disruption. But I got a few weeks in a row anyway. Yeah, and I'll be in KubeCon in Detroit. Anybody watching that's going there, ping me. I'll be there all week, coming in Sunday. All right. All right. Are you going to be there in Detroit? I thought I was going to fly to yours and we were going to drive it on Sunday. Uh, I'm not driving because I'm coming from a wedding on Saturday night. So there's no way I'm driving five hours after a wedding on Sunday. I will double up on your motorcycle and we'll go in. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I can drive a motorcycle. Anyway, that's the end of the show. My name's Steve Jaguar. I'm Mike Foster. Take care.